Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar entitled Dermatologic Ultrasound Clinical Applications, presented by Dr. Fernando Afajeme. Today's webinar will cover clinical applications of dermatologic ultrasound. The AIUM is accredited by the ACCME. This webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. By the conclusion of this webinar, participants will be able to understand the basics of dermatology for radiologists, explore the clinical applications of dermatologic ultrasound, and create a suite of services to dermatologists regarding ultrasound examinations. As an ACCME accredited provider, it is the AIUM's policy to ensure that the content and quality of this activity are balanced, independent, objective, and scientifically rigorous. At the conclusion of this webinar, you will be able to access the CME test located on the AIUM website. For more information on accessing the CME test and claiming credit, please refer to the handout provided in the dashboard on the right side of your screen. Participants who complete the post-test with a grade of 70% or higher will be awarded one CME credit. All individuals who are in a position to control the content of an educational activity are required to complete a disclosure form. All disclosures are reviewed by the AIUM and any conflicts of interest are resolved or managed prior to an activity. Dr. Fernando Afajeme and Darcy Pedido de Luna have no disclosures. Credits for this webinar are approved for physicians, sonographers, and radiologic technologists. During today's presentation, if you have questions for the presenter, you may type them into the question box on the right side of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout this webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering until the end of the presentation, at which time he will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And now I'm pleased to present Dr. Fernando Afajeme. Good. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Fernando Alfajeme. I am a dermatologist from Spain. Uh, I am also uh, a director of, of uh, the Ultrasound Learning Center for EFSUM, that is the European Federation of Ultrasound of Medicine. That's something similar to IUM, but in Europe. And, and I'm also collaborate in AUM as a vice chair with uh, together in the chair of Jimena Borsman in the dermatologic ultrasound group. Well, the, the title of, of the, sem the seminar today is clinical dermatology. Uh, what, what can we do with uh, ultrasound and what we can offer to our dermatologists so that they require our services and how can we convince dermatologists to start requesting uh, ultrasound, the utility that ultrasound may have for dermatologists. Then as I am a dermatologist, I can tell you more or less what we require. That's something that most, sometimes is more, much, much more a matter of communication between specialists, as you will see, than, than really the applications that, uh, that are numerous and the possibilities are enormous, as you will see. The only thing, that, that, that is difficult is not it's gonna be the after this webinar how you convince your dermatologist that you can offer services things uh, information that may be relevant for a better management of their dermatologic patients well let's just start with that what what do really dermatologists want huh? mm. okay dermatologists want Okay, the question, this question, uh, this question that that's, uh, Sigmund Fred said, well, uh, what do dermatologists want? What what are they requesting? What's, what's in the head of the dermatologists? That's an important question because if you know what is in the head of the dermatologist, you can ask or offer the, what they are asking, even if they don't know what they are, they are requiring now. What do they really want from ultrasonography? Well, in this, this sentence is resume what a dermatologist may need 
regarding uh, dermatologic ultrasound from us from, from as, 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 as professionals doing the ultrasound. Uh, dermato uh, dermatologists require useful information that they can understand, that intelligible information to offer to their patients, to offer more value to their patients for a best personal treatment. And these three parts, this useful, intelligible information for best personal treatment is important. It's important because the dermatologist must know what you are saying. Because in some reports, we sometimes uh, read from our colleagues here in, in Spain, maybe, I don't know, that that's something that maybe not happening in your country, in, in the States or in other parts of the world. Some reports are in a specifically located, ill-defined hypochoic structure to, re to correlate with clinical picture. It's, not, it's, it, it's of not use to us as dermatologists. It says nothing and it, it gives no value that I can offer to my patient. Then if I receive two, three reports like this, I will stop requiring dermatologic ultrasound. I need valuable information that it's help, helpful for me to better treat my patients. Then sometimes it's not the fault of the radiologist, it's the fault of the dermatologist because they don't know what to ask. For example, this is the requirement of, of a colleague of mine that requested uh, a, an ultrasound for, of me. And he said, well, please diagnose and indicate best treatment for in a specific erythema. Well, this is, she, she or he is not, doesn't, doesn't know what she's asking for or what, what she's looking for. Then if she or he, the, 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 your colleague is not, not knowledgeable about what, he or she wants, you cannot give what she's asking. This is not a, a reason to ask for an ultrasound, a dermatologic ultrasound. Then sometimes we have this, this kind of, of films with the dermatologist who is not able to see and the radiologist who doesn't understand really because she's not able, or he or she is not able to, to understand what, what the dermatologist is asking. And it, this leads to the, to the, to the failure of dermatological ultrasound. Then good communication, giving good information that it is useful for a better personalized treatment for your the patients of the dermatologist is gonna be key if you want to start doing ultrasound for your dermatologist. Let's go with the three main fields in which dermatologic ultrasound is useful. And I'm going to explain you what information is relevant for us as, as dermatologists and that you can offer so you, you can improve your relationship with your dermatologist that are going to require your exploration. As you remember, skin cancer is can be divided into two types, the melanoma skin cancer and non-melanoma skin cancer. The, the most frequent one is the non-melanoma skin cancer, this basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma mainly. We also have melanoma skin cancer that is less frequent, hopefully, and then, but it's more important to have a correct and uh, accurate diagnosis. Then ultrasound can be, can be key in the management and now uh, is key in the management of this patient, mainly in melanoma skin cancer with new treatments. As you know, the new therapies for melanoma skin cancer are uh, starting to make this uh, disease not as fatal as before. We have, we have not chronic uh, patients with melanoma and follow-up is made mainly with ultrasound and you can offer this follow-up for new treatments with uh, new treatments and nivolumumab, uh, dupilumab and, and other treatments that make this kind of non-melanoma skin cancer chronic but you in the follow-up ultrasound is key just to evaluate the state and the progression or the cure of this kind of cancers. Also in melanoma skin cancer, this is important because sometimes surgery must be directed in order to avoid complication or incomplete resections. Then ultrasound can be key and that's information that you can offer to your dermatologist too. This is melanoma. Melanoma is hopefully um, uh, uh, not very frequent uh, now. It's frequency, frequency is more or less 
one here in, in Spain would be one out of uh, 100,000 uh, every week we, we get here in Spain. Maybe in Australia, uh, as I know, I do, we have some some attendance from Australia is is really more frequent, and in in, in the states it's it's even frequent more frequent than here in Spain. There there is a lot of melanoma that that that, that fortunately I got I, I detected at, at, at the very beginning with the lower stages. This melanoma, as you know, it, it requires a good staging. Good staging is local staging of the tumor and regional staging of the tumor. We can offer a kind of sonographic breast load with high frequency probes. Now we are able to give our, our dermatologist the depth in millimeters that correlates very well with the histological uh, with the histological breast load. Now here in Europe, we are uh, starting to, to, to have a different strategy of treatment or surgical treatment with ultrasound. Instead of first biopsying the, the, the melanoma and after uh, making an, an uh, ampliation of the margin of the margins with the breast low index, we sometimes with the sonographic breast low take the decision to make the surgery just in once, not in two steps, as this is conventionally done. This is good for the patient and it's oncologically correct because there's a big correlation between the breast low, the breast low, the histological breast low, and the sonographic breast low. We can also assess near structures that is correlated with the T and the T and M classification, and we can also assess metastasis. In transient metastasis, nodal metastasis now are very important because this the early detection is key to have the opportunity to cure the patient with new treatments. And as I've, I told you, there has been a recent revolution in the treatment of melanoma patients regarding these new treatments. And the early detection of this metastasis or micrometastasis with ultrasound can be key for the cure of these patients. And I say cure because um, until when I started my residency, if you got a note, an effective note, the prognosis was going to be fatal. The possibilities to survive five years decreases a lot. Now, with early development, with early detection of micrometastasis or in transit metastasis, patients have opportunity of have a longer survivance and a more quality of life. Just to remind you some features of this kind of tumor, this melanoma is hypochoic, very hypochoic because it's very homogeneous cellular tumor type. And it, it is the tumor that has higher vascularization and it's correlated with the, uh, with the breast low of more, vas the more vascularization, the, the, the deeper the, the tumor will reach. As, I, as you may remember, the breast low that is measured in the image you have seen in your in your left, you can measure the breast slope going from just below the hypercoic line until the deepest hypercoic area of melanoma. This is the breast slope index. In this case, the sonographic breast slope has a big correlation with the histological breast slope. This is another kind of tumor. This is basal cell carcinoma. Basal cell carcinoma is the most common skin tumor in the human, the malignant skin tumor in the human being. It's mostly one out of five people will have a, a basal cell carcinoma that is very frequent. What information can be given with ultrasound? You can assess which skin structures are invaded. Then you can assess if only epidermis to detect superficial basal cell carcinoma, dermis obscurcutaneous tissue, or even uh, muscular muscular uh, structures of the face or the scalp are affected. And basal cell carcinoma is a first line, uh, as Jimena said, Jimena Wortman said, uh, for the evaluation of this kind of tumors, because a staging is very very precise, and you can. Uh, plan your surgery with uh, previous this intervention. Sometimes we dermatologists tend not to do many uh, image studies before a surgery. And then when we go to the operation room, we find surprises that are not very nice sometimes. 
with uh, ultrasound you get certainty of what you are going to find in your operation room that is very comforting for for us as surgeons or dermatologic surgeons most dermatologists are also dermatologic surgeons because our specialty is medical and surgical both of them most dermatologists do both things and you have to take into account that dermatologists are both doctors both medical doctors and surgeons and that's this surgical information can be very interesting also for your dermatologist. Diagnostic clues regarding this kind of tumors is that this tumor is hypochoic, this will have hyperechoic dots, and the vascularization is moderate. These hyperechoic dots are very, 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 um, very uh, correlated with the, uh, the the histological grade and the histologic uh, aggressivity of the tumor the more hyperechoic dots we have the most possibilities of uh, recurrence we have as it is uh, uh, an expression of the number of cells of the of the nests of basal cell carcinoma and it's an indicator of, of, of recurrence and aggressivity too. The more hyperechoic dots, that's some, some, some information that you can also give to your dermatologist, the aggressivity, the sonographic aggressivity of the tumor regarding that is correlated with this number of hyperechoic dots. This is another very frequent carcinoma, this non-melanoma non skin cancer, that is chemos cell carcinoma. This chemos cell carcinoma of the skin is quite frequent, not not so frequent at basal cell carcinoma, but quite quite frequent, and it's really underdiagnosed. And sometimes we diagnose it when this tumor has invaded a deeper structure because it's invasive. As you may see from the images, it, it has not so well defined borders, and it has the possibility of metastasis. Then you should assess both the the nearby structures and both the um, next nodal stations when you are starting this kind of patients. Then why, why ultrasound may be relevant in this kind, kind of tumors? We know that that a high risk uh, squamous cell carcinoma are those who are more than two millimeters. When this tumor reaches more than two millimeters, it's high risk. It has high risk or recurrence. Then sometimes surgery must be more, more wide or combined with radiotherapy. When near structures are, are there, we can assess if there's some kind of invasion. For example, in the scalp, the relationship with the, with the bone is important, with the deploy of the skull is important sometimes, or even in the relationship in, in the areas on, of cartilaginous areas to see or to assess if resection of cartilage is necessary or not. But something very important for pre-surgical planification and you go to the operation room, room, uh, room with another idea with you made this kind of surgical planification. Mm. Some dermatologists think that it's not important that you go to the operation room and you find whatever you want to find. And, but sometimes it gives you surprises when there's infiltration of, of the bone and you could have none with, with the entirety, you can avoid this kind of disgusting surprises. And you can also assess metastasis because this, this tumor may also have metastasis, near metastasis or far metastasis. The diagnostic look for this kind of tumor is this tends to be heterochoic, irregular margins, as you see, and it, it, it reflects this behavior, this invasive behavior, and it has all, also high vascularization, more than basal carcinoma and less than melanoma. There are other kinds of tumors that you can also assess with ultrasound that will be Kaposi's, uh, Kaposi's sarcoma that can be also detected with ultrasound and Merkel cell carcinoma that can also be assessed and it's good when you uh, are uh, trying to make a kind of uh, surgical planification in this kind of tumors. It's always good to have a plan before you get into your operation room. That's something that most dermatologists don't do. And if you can convince that they, they can go to operation room with a more confident and faster, because the operation rooms in dermatology must be very, very fast. So because surgeries are very, 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 very limited in time. And then if you have a planification before surgery, you can make even more surgeries in one day. That's another 
another thing you can offer to your dermatologist. As I, I, I was telling, the important part in this webinar, maybe not the images or maybe not the, the what the, the, the real sonography or the things that you from from the, the seminars by 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 Jimena Bosman and Dr. Catano have have have, have been seen. But how to convince your dermatologist, your dermatologist that ultrasound may be of useful of usefulness to them. The other big part in dermatologic ultrasound is uh, inflammatory skin diseases. Um, we go now from the skin uh, cancer skin diseases to the inflammatory skin diseases. It's inflammatory skin diseases uh, are very frequent. Some some say that inflammatory diseases in dermatology is the science of naming red skin in 10,000 different ways. There are at least 10,000 different diseases uh, in inflammatory skin skin diseases. If you go to a classic book, uh, you will see that the number of different inflammatory diseases in dermatology is enormous. Then, most of the times, diagnosis is not going to be the, the role of the dermatologic ultrasound, but for a couple of diseases that we are going to deal with. But we can offer informa information regarding the kind of, of inflammation and the extent of inflammation so that we can select the best treatment for this, for this patient. This possibility of personalization of individual medicine for the, your patient is something that is very valued by dermatologists. And our patients now, when we are doing uh, treatments in inflammatory skin diseases, Re demand us this ultrasound and if they don't see because we teach the, the patients to see their uh, dermatologic ultrasound they can see that inflammation is more or less and the, they the very patient requires requires us this dermatologic ultrasound we have been teaching our our patients that dermatologic ultrasound is important because we can personalize the treatment to his or her case then it's a, a work of education of the patient that also can be done by the dermatologist or by you as, as radiologist. When the, the, the skin becomes inflamed, these areas tend to be more uh, vascularized. We have more Doppler signals and uh, the echogenicity starts to be decreased. If, if you remember the, the wonderful we webinar by Dr. Catalano, you should always identify these layers of the skin, the epidermis, the dermis, and subcutaneous tissue. That in the case of inflammation, it start to be less echogenic, more like hy hypochoic, mainly in the upper dermis because of the superficial plexus that is located in this area. And in the subcutaneous tissue, you will see that instead of the hyperchoic septa that is are useful, uh, usual in this area, you will have that those hypochoic uh, septa that are a hallmark of paniculitis, of inflammation of the septa or the paniculus, together with the more ecogenicity of the uh, of the of the fatty cells that is reflected by hyperechogenicity of the subcutaneous tissue. This is a nice, nice example of a viral wart that is something that is very, very commonly uh, being treated by us, dermatologists or podiatrists. You can also offer this service to your, to your podiatrist because you can assess the extent of inflammation. In this case, the inflammation would be the, the, the hypochoic area marked with the W is reaching the epidermis and superficial dermis, not reaching the, the deeper part. Then you can uh, assess if this word is going to be tough or, or not whenever you are treating and even uh, predicting if the patient is going to need one, two or more treatments uh, by your podiatrist. In the case of lichen planus, you can see activity. Sometimes in some uh, inflammatory skin of the diseases, you don't know if the, uh, if, the, if the inflammation is active or not, such in the case of lichen planus or sclerosis diseases, as morphea, as you know, that sometimes it's very difficult to identify if the active if the, if the, if the, if the lesion is active or not. That is important because if the lesion is active, it will need anti-inflammatory treatment comparing with the fibrotic state. In the fibrotic state, the other the treatment will be different, totally different. It's something that you can also offer 
to your dermatologist when you are treating, treating this kind of diseases such as lichen planus or morphine. You can also assess the inflammation of follicular, uh, of follicular elements. As Jimena and Orlando have already told you, with dermatologic ultrasound and high frequency probe, in this case 22 MHz, we can assess the inflammation of the follicles. In this case, a case of tinea capitis, but also in the, in the cases of alopecia, we can also assess which is the state of the follicle. That is sometimes it's not so easy to assess from a clinical point of view because the inflammation is deep. In the case, for example, of lichen planus or front, frontal fibrosis alopecia, the clinician sometimes do not know if, the, if there's a signs of inflammation. And then your ultrasound may be useful to assess the inflammatory state to decide active treatment or observation. And to make a resume regarding this kind of diseases, these inflammatory skin diseases, we can assess with ultrasound if there is inflammation. That is easy, but it's when it's red. But some inflammatory diseases, as the deep inflammatory diseases, are not so if easily mm, evaluated as uh, the more superficial. Where is the inflammation? In the epidermis, there is subcutaneous tissue, because most of the times when the inflammation is reaching the lower dermis of subcutaneous tissue, systemic treatment and even biologics are going to be needed and quantified inflammation is there much inflammation the, the inflammation is improving with treatment or not a special case in in dermatologic patient is hydratinitis suprativa hydratinitis suprativa is an devastating inflammatory disease that is affecting more or less one percent of the population here in europe and is uh, characterized with this kind of lesions that from outside are the same. This, uh, this lesion, then maybe some, some of them are red, some of them have this kind of, of nodular, nodular, uh, nodular lesions, more uh, erythematous or with this kind of, 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 of fistula tract. Sometimes it's not very easy to detect where is the nodule, where is the fistula, or where is the abscess? And it's important because a fistula is not treated the same way as a nodule, and a nodule is not treated the same way, the same way as an abscess. Fistula tract indicates um, more aggressive diseases that may be even require bariatric treatment. And then for the selection of treatment, ultrasound is key in this kind of, of disease. This is a model in which ultrasound has been key in, in understanding a better treatment in this kind of patients. I recommend you to read this, uh, this uh, wonderful paper by Dr. Wortmann regarding this characterization of these lesions in this patient of heart identity superativa. As Jimena described, there is a gradient of inflammation that is correlated with the inflammation of the patients and with the stage of the, of the patients at the beginning the follicular widening and dermal nodes indicate that the inflammation is, uh, is mild. But when liquid collection, collection and fistula start, start to appear, then the disease is starting to make to be chronic. Then it's a no, no return point that should be not cross. Otherwise, surgery will be required. This is quite similar to what, what it's happening with Crohn disease. If we get the Crohn disease at the beginning and we treat it early, we are able to stop the disease. This is the same that we are seeing now in our patients of hydradenitis superativa. Then if you see this patient from the clinical point of view, it's all the same. It's all red, all, all weeping, all painful. There's not real correlation of clinical with what is really happening. The only way to see beyond the skin of this patient is ultrasound, the only one, remember. And we can also assess the evolution of our patient with hydrogenated superativa. For example, in this case, that is treated, this, it is treated with uh, rifampicin and clindamycin, that is standard uh, antibiotic treatment in this case of patient. We can see that inflammation is decreased in 12 weeks. Well, the patient will, will tell us that he or she is better, we, but we can make it also quite uh, evident for the dermatologist and for the patient because our patients are taught 
to see their own uh, ultrasounds so that they can they can see if the if the if the treatment is working for them this personalization as i as i've told you is very important in the relationship of the dermatologist with the dermatology patient and even with you well we've seen cancer skin cancer and, and the, the utility of skin cancer we've seen the utility in skin inflammation and inflammatory skin diseases remember hydrogenated supportive patients and the evaluation is key because sometimes we tend to underestimate the extension and the, of the disease and finally something that just has become an epidemic here in europe and south america the epidemics of aesthetics complication. Aesthetic complication is a common cause of consultation for of our patients. In our in our patients, we start we are starting to see that they are come they are coming to our to our outpatients with um, problems after the infiltration of these uh, of this kind of dermal fillers that that you will see that they are, they are not dermal fillers really. They are subcutaneous filler. This is a, call, a case that came to our clinics. The patient came regarding this uh, venous lesions in the lower lip, as you see this venous lesion in the lower lip, and she wanted them to be removed with lasers. When we explored her, we saw this this image. That's, that, as um, Jimena or Orlando will have told you, corresponds to a snowstorm pattern that is correlated to with silicon oil and polyacrylamide uh, with a polymethyl metriculate that can be related with these two kind of dermal fillers. Then in this case, there was something that was beyond the these little veins that 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 that, that, uh, that she wanted to be treated. If we had shot with our lasers these kind of lesions, we would have activated this filler and the, the patient would not have had problems. Then, uh, the thing is, the, the, the last one who touches the patient is going to assume all the uh, consequences, good and bad, and the complications. If we had uh, had our lasers in this patient, this filler would have been activated and inflammation for months would have been started. Hopefully we saw this implant and we refuse to treat this patient, avoiding this complication with lasers. Then what is the information we can offer to our, our dermatologists that are interested in assessing a, a patient with fillers? First of all, if there is any filler, we can see easily if there is a bump, but sometimes the filler is not so evident clinic, from a clinical point of view. And I tell you, most of the patients are going to tell you that there is no filler, that they have never had any filler because I don't know if it's something related to shame or something they want to hide to, to their wives or, 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 to, or to their husbands. I don't know, but, but people tend not to say to their physicians, that they have fillers. We can also assess where the filler is located in epidermis, dermis, subcutaneous tissue. What can, kind of filler is there? Is it non resorbable or resorbable? That is important regarding the prognosis if there's a complication. And if there is complication related to the filler, and we can see the extension of the, the complication and the prognosis of this complication. Remember, always refer to this kind of uh, of schema of the skin with the epidermis dermis and subcutaneous tissue where should we look for our uh, filler mainly in this area in dermal subdermal junction for superficial fillers and subcutaneous tissue for uh, deep fillers and this is the area you have to look at and remember that there are two main kinds of fillers the silicone oil filler non resorbable and the non-silicon, the silicon and the non-silicon. In this non-silicon that, that are more numerous is the hyaluronic acid, acrylamide, and other as polylactic acid, acetylcysteine, and so on others. You have to identify this as no storm pattern because it's quite frequent. Now silicon oil is not uh, permitted in America and Europe, but it's something that we 
is still fine if in our older oldest patient and those who have gone to south america for treatments then it's, this is no porn it's no storm pattern it's quite common and sometimes it can be a uh, clinic from a clinical point of view can be uh, confu confused with uh, with diseases as scleroderma or morphia mm? when we in the depth we have this snow storm pattern this is no storm pattern is mandatory to be discarded when we suspect a, 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 a complication of a filler. The next pattern is vascular pattern. This vascular pattern is very common because now the most common filler that is used is hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid and polycarbonate have this kind of uh, vascular pattern. This is the pure hyaluronic acid and pure polycarbonate will have this kind of vascular pattern mm -hmm. then that we can assess. And a third pattern that is important to know is this cottony pattern. This cottony pattern is the evolution of, uh, of uh, another kind of pattern, this evolutive pattern of hyaluronic acid of the reaction to any kind of fillers. We have this kind of, of, of dirty, dirty image in the subcutaneous tissue that blurs the dermal subdermal junction. In you can see some vacuoles that are also related to the to the previous previously implanted uh, filler. This is a case in which we had a recurrent uh, periorbital mysterious inflammation in a patient, and we when we started uh, exploring this patient, we saw this snow pattern that was compressing. As you see, we were, we were compressing the superficial veins therefore producing a stasis in the veins of the face of this patient. Then the, the solution to some of these bumps that appear and disappear in the face sometimes is the presence of fillers. It's good to discard that, that the patient is filler. It has a filler. And then when this bump appear and disappear, it must be discarded. Sometimes we, the use of uh, elastography, we can detect to the presence of these fillers that can be camouflated because the patient that has fillers tend to have not only one kind of filler, they tend to mix as layers of, of, of uh, one of another, of, of, of an, of an, of, of, after another, they have at the base, maybe silicone oil, and if she has, or she or he has had an implant in the 90s, she would have had polyethylamide and in the early uh, 2000, uh, high acid. And you, and you can see at the earth strata how this kind of, of deposit are, uh, can be located. Um, sometimes they are quite invisible, and you can detect them with this uh, uh, elastography that is useful to to detect this subclinical or sub uh, sub B mode, let's say, uh, acrylamide or hyaluronic acid vacuoles inside the silicone oil uh, implant that this patient had. A couple of words regarding the skin elastography. That's something that you can also offer to your patient. This is kind of uh, this is skin elastography. In this is skin elastography. You have, uh, you can also assess with superficial probes the elastography of normal skin. I, by normally, uh, dermis tend to be more hard than subcutaneous tissue, more or less with this kind of relationship. You can also do with, with new equipment, share wave. And uh, skin cancer tend to be harder than normal skin. That is something that is maybe not, not very useful but you must know that in case, case of doubt these kind of tumors tend to be more stiff and something in which this can be interesting is in sclerosing diseases that's morphia in morphia the skin tends to be stiffer and in the follow-up and treatment active treatment or restoration of these patients elastography may be a useful tool you can you can offer to the dermatologist to make a personalized close follow-up for a detection of subtle changes in morphia that sometimes, as this is a deep disease, is not easily assessed by inspection or palpation. 
sometimes we we in our melanoma patients we have very very small uh, nodules that sometimes are not even palpable this is a case of an accident of a patient of us that has had this very very small node that was very doubtful with it being mold and even with Doppler, it, it, the measure was three millimeters. Then, with uh, illustrography, we were able to detect this subclinical sub B mold uh, lesion that flare up in red, that in our equipment is hard, and permitted us to detect. This micrometastasis. As I told you, it, early detection in melanoma is key because it gives the opportunity of, of the patient to, to have a very long survival with new treatments. Then early the diagnosis is key, even in this sub uh, or millimetric metastasis that will require systemic treatment with new treatments. And sometimes as I've told you, we can detect some uh, some implants that were not so evident. To conclude, uh, as you've seen, dermatologic ultrasound is an, uh, an application that has come to stay. You will start to see more publications, more papers regarding dermatologic ultrasound, as there are more radiologists doing dermatologic ultrasound and more dermatologists doing this dermatologic ultrasound, and we have to collaborate to make the most of this technique. I think that this good is a win-win relationship. This dermatologic, dermatologist, radiologist relationship is, is 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 good. This information must be useful, and if we are able to optimize and personalize the treatment of the dermatologic patient, it's going to be very valued by both the dermatologist and the dermatologic patient. The good education of the dermatologist and the dermatologic patient is, is, is good for you regarding what you can offer. And this communication understanding the necessities of the dermatologist and radiologist are key to make this perfect tandem. This is my email if you want to contact me regarding any kind of question. And now if Darcy uh, are, is so kind we we can uh, we can answer uh, the questions you have been making during this webinar and at the moment we have one question 